Until recently, agriculture has been the chief occupation even in advanced societies. Hence, any change in methods of tillage has much importance. Early plows, drawn by two oxen, did not normally turn the sod but merely scratched it. Thus, cross-plowing was needed and fields tended to be squarish. In the fairly light soils and semi-arid climates of the Near East and Mediterranean, this worked well. But such a plow was inappropriate to the wet climate and often sticky soils of northern Europe. By the latter part of the 7th century after Christ, however, following obscure beginnings, certain northern peasants were using an entirely new kind of plow equipped with a vertical knife to cut the line of the furrow, a horizontal share to slice under the sod, and a mold board to turn it over. The friction of this plow with the soil was so great that it normally required not two, but eight oxen. It attacked the land with such violence that cross-plowing was not needed, and fields tended to be shaped in long strips. In the days of the scratch plow, fields were distributed generally in units capable of supporting a single family. Subsistence farming was the pre presupposition. But no peasant owned eight oxen. To use the new and more efficient plow, peasants pooled their oxen to form large plow teams, originally receiving, it would appear, plowed strips in proportion to their contribution. Thus, distribution of land was based no longer on the needs of a family, but, rather, on the capacity of a power machine to till the earth. Man's relation to the soil was profoundly changed. Formerly, man had been a part of nature. Now he was the exploiter of nature. Nowhere else in the world did farmers develop any analogous agricultural implement. Is it coincidence that modern technology, with its ruthlessness toward nature, has so largely been produced by descendants of these peasants of northern Europe? This same exploitive attitude appears slightly before A.D. 830 in Western illustrated calendars. In older calendars, the months were shown as passive personifications. The new Frankish calendars, which set the style for the Middle Ages, are very different. They show men coercing the world around them, plowing, harvesting, chopping trees, butchering pigs. Man and nature are two things, and man is master. These novelties seem to be in harmony with larger intellectual patterns. What people do about their ecology depends on what they think about themselves in relation to things around them. Human ecology is deeply conditioned by beliefs about our nature and destiny, that is, by religion. To Western eyes, this is very evident in, say, India or Ceylon. It is equally true of ourselves and of our medieval ancestors. The victory of Christianity over paganism was the greatest psychic revolution in the history of our culture. It has become fashionable today to say that, for better or worse, we live in the post-Christian age. Certainly, the forms of our thinking and language have largely ceased to be Christian, but to my eye, the substance often remains amazingly akin to that of the past. Our daily habits of action, for example, are dominated by an implicit faith in perpetual progress which was unknown either to Greco-Roman antiquity or to the Orient. It is rooted in, and is indefensible apart from, Judeo-Christian teleology. The fact that communists share it merely helps to show that it can be demonstrated on many other grounds, that Marxism, like Islam, is a Judeo-Christian heresy. We continue today to live, as we have lived for about 1700 years, very largely in a context of Christian axioms. What did Christianity tell people about their relations with the environment? While many of the world's mythologies provide stories of creation, Greco-Roman mythology was singularly incoherent in this respect. Like Aristotle, the intellectuals of the ancient West denied that the visible world had had a beginning. Indeed, the idea of a beginning was impossible in the framework of their cyclical notion of time. In sharp contrast, Christianity inherited from Judaism not only a concept of time as non-repetitive and linear, but also a striking story of creation. By gradual stages, a loving and all-powerful God had created light and darkness, the heavenly bodies, the earth and all its plants, animals, birds, and fishes. Finally, God had created Adam, and, as an afterthought, Eve to keep man from being lonely. Man named all the animals, thus establishing his dominance over them. God planned all of this explicitly for man's benefit and rule. No item in the physical creation had any purpose save to serve man's purposes. And, although man's body is made of clay, he is not simply part of nature, he is made in God's image. Especially in its Western form, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has seen.
As early as the second century, both Tertullian and Saint Irenaeus of Lyon were insisting that when God shaped Adam, he was foreshadowing the image of the incarnate Christ, the second Adam. Man shares, in great measure, God's transcendence of nature. Christianity, in absolute contrast to ancient paganism and Asia's religion, except perhaps Zoroastrianism, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for his proper ends. At the level of the common people, this worked out in an interesting way. In antiquity, every tree, every spring, every stream, every hill had its own genius loci, its guardian spirit. These spirits were accessible to men, but were very unlike men. Centaurs, fauns, and mermaids show their ambivalence. Before one cut a tree, mined a mountain, or dammed a brook, it was important to placate the spirit in charge of that particular situation and to keep it placated. By destroying pagan animism, Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood or indifference to the feelings of natural objects. It is often said that for animism the church substituted the cult of saints. True, but the cult of saints is functionally quite different from animism. The saint is not in natural objects. He may have special shrines, but his citizenship is in heaven. Moreover, a saint is entirely a man. He can be approached in human terms. In addition to saints, Christianity of course also had angels and demons inherited from Judaism and perhaps, at one remove, from Zoroastrianism. But these were all as mobile as the saints themselves. The spirits in natural objects, which formerly had protected nature from man, evaporated. Man's effective monopoly on spirit in this world was confirmed, and the old inhibitions to the exploitation of nature crumbled. When one speaks in such sweeping terms, a note of caution is in order. Christianity is a complex faith, and its consequences differ in differing contexts. What I have said may well apply to the medieval West, where in fact technology made spectacular advances, but the Greek East, a highly civilized realm of equal Christian devotion, seems to have produced no marked technological innovation after the late 7th century, when Greek fire was invented. The key to the contrast may perhaps be found in a difference in the tonality of piety and thought which students of comparative theology find between the Greek and the Latin churches. The Greeks believed that sin was intellectual blindness and that salvation was found in illumination, orthodoxy, that is, clear thinking. The Latins, on the other hand, felt that sin was moral evil and that salvation was to be found in right conduct. Eastern theology has been intellectualist. Western theology has been voluntarist. The Greek saint contemplates. The Western saint acts. The implications of Christianity for the conquest of nature would emerge more easily in the Western atmosphere. The Christian dogma of creation, which is found in the first clause of all the creeds, has another meaning for our comprehension of today's ecologic crisis. By revelation, God had given man the Bible, the book of scripture. But, since God had made nature, nature also must reveal the divine mentality. The religious study of nature for the better understanding of God was known as natural theology. In the early church, and always in the Greek East, nature was conceived primarily as a symbolic system through which God speaks to men. The ant is a sermon to sluggards. Rising flames are the symbol of the soul's aspiration. This view of nature was essentially artistic rather than scientific. While Byzantium preserved and copied great numbers of ancient Greek scientific texts, science as we conceive it could scarcely flourish in such an ambiance. However, in the Latin West, by the early 13th century, natural theology was following a very different bent. It was ceasing to be the decoding of the physical symbols of God's communication with man, and was becoming the effort to understand God's mind by discovering how his creation operates. The rainbow was no longer simply a symbol of hope first sent to Noah after the deluge. Robert Grosteste, test Friar Roger Bacon, and Theodoric of Freiburg produced startlingly sophisticated work on the optics of the rainbow, but they did it as a venture on religious understanding. From the 13th century onward, up to and including Leibniz and Newton, every major scientist in effect explained his motivations in religious terms. Indeed, if Galileo had not been so expert an amateur theologian, he would have got into far less trouble. The professionals resented his intrusion. And Newton seems to have regarded himself more as a theologian than as a scientist. 
It was not until the late 18th century that the hypothesis of God became unnecessary to many scientists. It is often hard for the historian to judge, when men explain why they are doing what they want to do, whether they are offering real reasons or merely culturally acceptable reasons. The consistency with which scientists during the long formative centuries of Western science said that the task and the reward of the scientist was to think God's thoughts after him leads one to believe that this was their real motivation. If so, then modern Western science was cast in a matrix of Christian theology. The dynamism of religious devotion, shaped by the Judeo-Christian dogma of creation, gave it impetus.